know that they're worried. And, um, and you know, that's kind of all the thought we put into it. But I do want to kind of shift your thinking into anxiety as more of a medical diagnosis, uh, because I think with that shift in mentality, you can, um, it helps you to conceptualize anxiety a little bit easier and it helps you to treat anxiety a little bit easier. So um, we'll start off with this very mysterious slide here. Um, what do brownies, blue eyes, and bananas have to do with anxiety? Um, so really we, we can break these down into some questions. Why do we crave fats and sweets and salts and all those things that are terrible for us? Um, we just can't seem to get enough of them. Um, and the very simple answer is, is that um, in the last update that our brain received um, about 10,000 years ago, those were very limited resources. And, and it was very advantageous for us to, to, um, to seek after those things and to eat lots of those things when they were available. So our brain has, has been hardwired to crave those things. Now, in modern society where snack foods are not only available, they're often the cheapest things at the supermarket, um, and it's easy to get our hands on them, um, you know, welcome to the modern day obesity crisis. Um, prefer blue eyes, I know this is subjective, but, um, but interestingly enough, um, it is more difficult for people with blue eyes to deceive. Um, pupil dilation is, is actually a big part of deception, um, or it can actually give you away as a deceiver. And so um, many, many, many decades and centuries ago, um, people who had blue eyes were, were viewed as more trustworthy. Okay, so that one's kind of a, that one's kind of a more, uh, that's an that's a educated guess we have going. But then we have things with harder evidence. Um, like, I don't know if any of you have ever been walking through a parking garage with a banana in your hand, but um, if you do, it looks green. Um, it's, it's a very weird phenomenon. But um, the reason for that is because over the many centuries, our eyes and our brain have adapted to um, kind of interpret different colors within different light spectrums. And so whether it's morning or dusk, or even if we're under like fluorescent lights or any other type of light, we can usually identify that, hey, that banana is yellow. But Parking garage lights, they use a, a different type of light, a new light that's been invented in the last, you know, say 20, 10, 15, 20 years. And our brain hasn't updated yet. And so bananas will take on a different color. The color yellow will look green. And um, so <clears throat> all of this is to say is that the last update that our brain has received was about 10,000 years ago. And we were dealing with very different problems then than we are now, okay? So before I talk directly about how that impacts anxiety, um, let's talk about the brain just a little bit. There is, um, there is a, a system in our brain called the parath parasympathetic nervous system. And there's no quiz after this. You don't actually need to remember that word. But um, I just want to introduce you to this concept, okay? When our body needs to calm down, okay, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Um, this is what slows our heart rate down. This is what um, kind of gives the body the signal that, hey, it's okay to start digesting and recharging and healing yourself. Um, you know, it relaxes our muscles. Um, it is sometimes colloquially referred to as the feed and breed system or the rest and digest system. Okay, so this is when the body starts to repair itself. I have a picture of someone sleeping because the absolute pinnacle of this system is helping you to fall asleep. You're, when your body is in such a relaxed state, you are asleep. And that's when all oh, the body starts to heal itself. That's when um, our memories start to consolidate. That's when the body just kind of prepares itself physically for the next day. Okay, so now let's, let's bring it back to where our brain, um, our lack of a brain update might, uh, might be hurting us a little bit. So the opposite of that, um, is the sympathetic nervous system. So just as our body needs a system to kind of shut us down at night, or um, if we're lucky enough to get the, a nap in the middle of the day, you know, to put us to sleep, um, it also needs a system to help us get up and go, okay? Um, this is often referred to as a fight or flight response. 
um, usually it's not that intense. Usually um, the activation of the sympathetic nervous system is, is basically you wake up in the morning and you recognize you need to wake up and um, you know, whatever it is, get your cup of coffee, get ready for the day, go to work. Okay, your, your sympathetic nervous system is what's helping you to do that. Um, my dragon software just came on. That was. Um, I need to. Uh, it is going away. We're going to pause for just a second and we'll get back going in just a second. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, modern technology is great, but sometimes my uh, dictation software turns itself on and starts transcribing everything I'm saying. And it's not creepy at all. But uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so we have uh, the sympathetic nervous system that, that just allows us to use the, the resources that we have. Okay. This is when this system is activated, we are using energy. Okay. So we're not we're not digesting things at that time. We're not, um, we're not relaxed, you know, we're not repairing ourselves or healing. Um, telltales of this are increased heart rate. Um, you know, our pupils might dilate, our, our, our mouth might become dry. So the absolute pinnacle of this is, is the fight or flight response. When, when our body is really getting ready to run away, to sprint or to fight something, uh, because it senses that we are in real danger, okay? So what you really need to ask yourself is, um, are you really in danger when you're feeling anxiety? Maybe, maybe some of us are in positions to, to really and truly be in danger, but usually when we are feeling this arousal, when we are feeling like, um, when we're feeling nervous or worried about something, um, it's usually because maybe we have a project due, or maybe we're we're meeting somebody from high school, and we don't want to we don't we don't want them to see how fat we've gotten because we couldn't control our our fats and sweets and salty intake, right? It's our brain's fault, but um, it can be anything. And so this this instinct to run away and your body preparing you to run away isn't helping at all. And as a matter of fact, it kind of makes you feel bad. You know, your, your heart starts to pound. That doesn't feel good when you're just sitting in a chair um, or your muscles get really tight to prepare you to start running away really fast. That actually starts to feel painful after a while. Um, so this, if this is your, anxiety is your body having a very natural reaction to um, feeling nervous or to feeling like, um, that you need to fix something, but it just doesn't have the right tools to help you deal with it, okay? So I want us to understand fully what anxiety is from kind of a more biological standpoint as we move forward. So just recent statistics, just real quick, 4.4 um, million children have been diagnosed with anxiety, 1.9 million children um, have, a, as a, have a depression diagnosis. That was in 2019. Um, both anxiety and depression symptoms um, and the diagnoses have increased um, throughout the past 20 years, okay? And um, why that is, is, um, is probably a different presentation all by itself, um, but we will talk about why it has increased a little bit as, as we move forward in the presentation. But interestingly enough, I thought it would be good to, to kind of pause and, <clears throat> and look at how anxiety has evolved just in the past year. Because the statistics look very different um, from one year to the next. So um, last year, we had about 7.1% of the child adolescent population with, who had a diagnosis of anxiety of some sort, okay? Um, anxiety is the most common mental illness amongst um, children and adolescents. Um, depression is also very common. There is a, a, a rate of about 3.2% of the population. Now, in 2020, we're looking at 18.9% of, of the 
child adolescent population and 22.6 um, of the child adolescent population with a diagnosis of depression. So 18.9 for anxiety, 22.6 for depression. These are rough estimates. Um, this, these studies are slow. So this is actually um, the second column there under 2020 is early indicators from China. Okay, so China had been dealing with this, um, with the lockdown, with the, with the pandemic a lot earlier. So we're starting to get some of the data back from them. Um, and those are what their, their numbers reflect. Now, whether that's going to be accurate for, for us or not, I think it is safe to say, though, that we are going to see some pretty sharp increases in anxiety, not only in adults, but in children as well. <clears throat> so just really quickly, um, anxiety is the, uh, is the feelings of worry, um, tension, apprehension, or unease, okay, regarding an imminent event or a situation with an unknown outcome, okay? So you are making a lot of assumptions about and a lot of worries about what is going to happen next, okay? Um, <clears throat> it's important to remember that um, a lot of anxiety symptoms can increase during anniversaries of events. Um, and just that's something that your brain kind of keeps track of. So you might all of a sudden notice that you have um, an increase in anxiety, not know why it might be important to reflect on timelines and what has happened recently or in the past year. Um, and as I said before, anxiety is um, the most prevalent mental illness. Uh, um, so I'm gonna go through this at a fairly quick uh, pace, um, just because I, I just wanna, I want you to kind of generally become familiar with different types of anxiety, but then we can get into treatments and, and other things like that. So generalized anxiety is probably what people think of the most. Um, when they say anxiety, they, they typically mean generalized anxiety. Uh, this, this is just talking about global worry, that you just tend to be a worrier. You, you, um, it, it may kind of, some of your worries may cluster around certain areas, but in general, you tend to to worry about a lot of unknown factors. Some symptoms of this, um, it might present as restlessness, um, where you just don't feel like you can sit still or you're constantly changing positions or you just can't get comfortable. Um, or if you're just tired and you don't know why, you slept through the night, um, you don't have sleep apnea and you're still tired, it, you might be anxiety. Uh, difficulty concentrating or your mind going blank if you find yourself often maybe stopping in the middle of a sentence to, to find the correct word, uh, that might be an artifact of anxiety. Um, you're not going senile, you know, I think there's lots of other reasons um, that you can, you, 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 can, you can experience your mind going blank. Um, irritability, so if, you just, if you're kind of grouchy, muscle tension, this is muscle pain, okay? A lot of people, they have unexplained pains um, that often contributes to more worry and it's a, uh, it's kind of a self-perpetuating process. Um, and sleep disturbance. Um, most people think of not being able to fall asleep, but early waking is also a sign of anxiety. If you're just kind of up and you don't know why, um, it, it could be anxiety. And these symptoms need to persist for about, uh, about six months. So um, with social anxiety, we are this is an irrational fear of being in social situations. What you can basically look at this as is you're, you have a fear of scrutiny. If you show up to a social group, you're afraid that you're going to be judged, that you're gonna do something silly, um, that what you do is going to be made fun of. Um, so this is often just based on um, lots of assumptions. You can kind of think of this, I use this as kind of a, a behavioral, analogy like so when you're going to you get invited to a party and you're getting dressed and you're ready to go and then this thought pops into your head and that you know what if I go I think they're going to make fun of me or nobody's going to talk to me or such and such is going to bring up that thing that I said to them last week and it's going to be an awkward conversation something pops into our head that says you know hey it's going to be a good idea not to go so you don't go and so your brain says, hey, you remember all those things you were afraid were gonna happen? They didn't happen. So we must have done a good job. 
But the problem there is that, of course, we didn't actually know that it was going to happen. These were assumptions that we thought were going to happen. And in many ways, this is what anxiety is born from, is when we make these assumptions, our brain is very gullible. It's going to go with whatever you think, whatever it thinks up. It's going to believe that it actually would have happened had you gone. And so it starts to give itself a pat on the back and say, hey, we did a great job avoiding um, scrutiny. And so we're going to keep up this pattern of behavior and we don't do anything to challenge it. Um, so as we get used to living in that pattern, um, then it starts to kind of take hold in our life. So especially when talking about uh, childhood anxiety, we need to talk about separation anxiety, um, which is just when excessive distress, um, and we can maybe call it prolonged distress, um, where they um, where they just they worry about it a little bit too long. I think it's natural for when a parent is kind of breaking away from a child and maybe leaving for work or something, they might feel a little bit um, uncomfortable for a minute or two, but they should get over it. Um, if they're just kind of moping all day and worrying about you all day, or if they're at school and, they, and they're just worried about you and if you're safe, or, um, then this is gonna be separation anxiety, okay? Um, they're gonna make a lot of us negative assumptions. They're gonna wonder about car accidents and they're gonna worry about your health. And um, since they're not there to keep tabs on you, they, they worry and that's why they want you present. They want to make sure that you're safe and that you're with them. Um, and oftentimes we will see nightmares with separation themes. Another thing we will often see with separation anxiety is separation themes entering play. Um, you can learn a lot about a child by how they play and the themes in, in which they adopt when they play. Um, and this is true of separation anxiety, um, but this is also true of all anxiety, especially with children. It will often manifest as physical symptoms. Um, kids will often get tummy aches when they have anxiety. So you know, as, as parents, we've probably all gotten that those days where our kid has a spelling test and their stomach magically hurts and we're like, whatever, you better go to school, quit faking it. Um, I think in many instances they are faking it, <laughs> but, um, but sometimes it really could be nerves, you know, is, are getting the better of them. Kids tend to internalize anxiety like that and, um, and, it, and it makes them hurt. Okay, whether that be muscle pain or stomach pain. <clears throat> specific phobias, um, this is when a specific object or situation um, bothers a child to an excessive degree. Okay? Many children have something that they're afraid of. Um, many children have things that they're afraid of that aren't exactly rational fears. Um, we're looking at magnitude here. To what magnitude are they afraid of? Um, it's kind of healthy to be afraid of sharks, right? They're a predator that lives in the ocean. We don't do well in the water. But if a shark comes on TV and the kid has to leave the room, that might be a little bit excessive. Um, or if, you know, it's a picture of a shark in a book or somebody just mentions the word shark um, and they have to leave the room. Y you know, this is, this is what we do um, that we might, we might say, okay, that's a little excessive. Let's go ahead and get you some therapy. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we, we want to do um, exposure therapies there, where it's, hey, tell you what, we're going we're gonna to give you some exposures to this, to this thing that you're afraid of in a very small and systematic way so that your brain can learn that you don't need to be afraid of it. Um, so we want to give them that hands-on experience with not being afraid of it. <clears throat> So I have these next two in red because they are not technically anxiety disorders, but they are the same family. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, obsessions are intrusive recurrent thoughts or urges or images um, that pop into your head and you can't really get rid of them. Okay, so um, this does happen a lot with trauma uh, where, you know, you're replaying the, the traumatic event, um, you 
do not have to be traumatized to have obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, obsessive thoughts can often be pictures of your kitchen burning down. So you want to go check the oven and um, you can't get that thought out of your head until guess what? You give into the compulsion to go check your oven. So compulsions are often the compulsives part of obsessive compulsive compulsions are often done to get rid of the obsessive thoughts. So if you are highly worried about your house burning down, then the compulsion of checking the stove 13 times is going to help you deal with that obsession. Um, or, you know, if, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, people want to stay extra organized. It has to be a certain way. Um, if it's not a certain way, you don't necessarily believe something's going to happen, but you can't get it out of your head until you get it right. And so you can see why that might start to make you late for work or um, could be a financial burden. Um, but many, many of these um, obsessions and these compulsions are um, very similar to what anxiety is, um, but it is separate, but it's treated very similarly. Um, and then with post-traumatic stress, um, this is when they have experienced, heard about, um, or witnessed something traumatic, okay? So uh, this is uh, something that's highly complicated and it can have a global effect on a child. It can, in, it can impact their physical health. It can impact, of course, their mental health, um, their cognitive functioning. Um, it can do just about anything. So if we feel like um, our child has experienced trauma, we want to get them help as soon as possible. Um, to, to just kind of and help them be monitored by a professional so that they can keep tabs on on everything that's happening because what happens with a traumatic event is your brain updates immediately so I think we've all been through this where we're, we're trying to um, teach our children a new skill and we're literally on the hundredth time teaching them and they haven't gotten it yet and we're just wondering can they learn anything you know, it's something that's relevant to their life. Our kids are smart, you know, but we're still having to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse it's just so they can learn it. You know, brains don't necessarily take in information easily. It has to be done through lots and lots of repetition. It's different with trauma, okay? So the brain's number one um, job that it's given itself is to protect us. So if it feels like, um, it needs to update something instantly, it will. And trauma does that. So if, uh, <clears throat> if you get into a car accident, a pretty bad car accident, and you just felt like your life was in peril, your brain is going to immediately say, okay, well, let's go ahead and just avoid all cars. And because uh, we almost died in one, I'm just not gonna mess with it. Um, and it might, then generalize to, well, I don't even want to be near cars. So let's, uh, let's keep, let's stay inside or, or something. So um, we definitely want to address that um, when possible. So um, with, with the anxiety, it does present a little bit differently in children and adolescents, and we want to be aware of that. Um, so these are, um, these are symptoms that are more likely to exist uh, within children than, than in adults. So um, impacting sleep. Um, a lot of adult, adults experience insomnia and early waking, but with kids, it can be a little bit more apparent because they often have bedtime schedules and they've been on a routine for a while. Um, and so then when, if that all of a sudden shifts, we wanna start exploring, has anything changed? Um, you know, has anything changed in their environment or has their perception on something changed? Um, picking at skin um, is another one or nail biting or hair twisting um, or hair picking. Um, just any way that kids will often develop these tick-like behaviors um, to help them cope with anxiety. <clears throat> and then we have um, things like an exaggerated startle response, you know, or a, just a really uh, a hair trigger startle response um, might be a sign of it. Um, 
being very self-critical, saying things like, I, I'm just not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Um, you know, so-and-so is better than me, or you don't love me as much as you love so-and-so, or just whatever it might be. Um, OCD-like behaviors, um, avoiding social contact. I know a lot of kids who have developed anxiety very early on, um, they just kind of get labeled as shy and, and that's them. Um, but, it, you know, I think it's important in certain situations to kind of encourage them to come out of their shell. Um, you don't want to force them or, or be overly, you don't want to be strong armed about it, but um, you know, you do want to encourage them, but also fear of being alone where they just, they just start to imagine all of these crazy things that might happen to them. And this includes maybe even being in the next room alone. Um, but uh, frequent urination or digestive issues uh, when stressed, once again, kids will typically get stomach problems with anxiety. Um, um, so also since, well, Usually, kid, many many hours are spent at school for kids. A large part of their life is school, so it's also important to uh, look at anxiety and how it interacts within the school system. Um, if there is kind of uh, some refusal uh, to go to school, um, or just kind of ambivalence, you know, they just kind of like, yeah, they don't care. You know, they they almost just seem like <laughs> they're being marched off to the slaughter. You know, they. Just, they don't care that they're they're going to school. If you feel like they've kind of given up, um, once again, you might want to look into anxiety as a possible cause. Um, difficulty participating in class. If you get notes the same, you know, so and so is just not engaging with the material. We certainly want to look at well, maybe they just don't get it, um, like they got previous materials. Um, but it could also be that they're they're kind of retreating inside a little bit which is an instinct when you're feeling anxious is to kind of withdraw a little bit. Um, so, you know, disruptive and squirmy behavior. Um, what's, what we have to keep in mind as, as parents is that kids can be disruptive without intending to be disruptive. Um, we oftentimes think of disruptive children as those kids that are trying to get attention, um, that they just, they're, they're headstrong, they, they're trying to get their way by introducing a power struggle. But um, disruptive behavior can, and squirmy behavior can often be anxiety where they just can't sit still and then kind of moving around and kind of bothers other kids. And um, when you have anxiety, it's very hard to get comfortable. Um, your, your muscles are very tight and, um, and so it's not necessarily intentioned uh, disruptive behavior, um, but frequent trip to the nurses. Uh, once again, you see that fancy word somatization. It just means that this is anxiety that's being felt physically, that's being manifest physically through stomach pains, through uh, muscle pain, through headaches. And um, we wanna keep an eye on that. Um, disciplinary issues, if they're all of a sudden getting in trouble where they didn't before, um, you know, being avoidant um, of things that scares them or makes them nervous is a very big motivation. We have kids all the time that would rather just take a zero on an assignment than hand in an assignment, see it marked off, and have to deal with that, that negative evaluation from the teacher. Uh, and these are kids that are concerned about their grades. <laughs> you know, it's, they, they want nothing more than to get straight A's and to please their teacher and to please their parents. But in their head, it's better to just not do a homework assignment than to do the homework assignment and potentially get a question wrong. <clears throat> okay, and that certainly goes in with turning in homework. So, <clears throat> so then the question is, what do I, what do I actually do about this? Um, so how can I nurture, protect, and support my child? Um, encourage open and honest communication. Um, the second one is a, is a big one, perhaps the biggest one that uh, I see parents not do. Um, if you have elevated anxiety, 
um, reflect on that with your child. It's not something that you need to hide. I think parents often do their children a disservice when they hide it. Um, you don't have to sit there and be like, hey, uh, you know, dad's really anxious about uh, the, our financial situation. Um, I just don't know how we're going to pay these bills. Um, no, that's going to implant some anxiety in your child. But you can say, whew, you know, I've, I'm really... I'm really kind of feeling nervous or anxious or worried about some stuff right now. I think I need to go on a walk. Um, or I think I'm gonna go upstairs and talk to your mother about this for a little bit. It always helps me to talk to people when I'm feeling worried. And then boom, you've modeled a healthy coping strategy to your child. Um, whereas oftentimes when we try to hide it, um, all our child notices is that mom and dad got a little bit grumpy and I don't know why. Um, because we're, we're, we're spending so much of our cognitive and emotional resources on, you know, hiding our anxiety from our children that it just comes off as grumpy and irritable. Um, so you want, you want to develop, um, you know, support systems, whether that be family and friends or, um, you know, traditions in your house. Um, you know, holistic approaches, which in, of course includes spirituality. <coughs> um, and that can be, that doesn't necessarily have to be religion. It can be uh, going on nature walks. It can be meditation. Um, <clears throat> you want to encourage positive behaviors by praising positive behaviors. A lot of times kids' anxiety comes from just not knowing exactly what they're supposed to do. At, at a young age, and even at a not so young age, um, kids really appreciate to appreciate knowing exactly what your expectations are and exactly what kind of things they do that you like. And um, it just gives them a nice direction. It lets them know that uh, they're doing good things and that good things are happening in their life. Um, routine, routine, routine. Um, you really can't get enough mileage out of routine with an anxious child, with children in general, but especially with anxious children. Just them being able to plan out um, what's going to happen um, helps them to anticipate and plan ahead. Um, and then develop a crisis and emergency plan. Um, just if you feel, and this is especially for older children, just if they feel like their anxiety is overwhelming them, and they start to develop some suicidal ideation, you're gonna want a safety plan in, in place. <clears throat> and then um, just, just have fun. I think it's really important, especially um, right now when we're staying at home a little bit more, you have to plan to have fun and you have to plan these activities. And I think kids will often gripe about planned activities. They will call them cheesy or that's boring, that's not fun. And you've kind of just got to motivate them to, to do it, you know, like, don't let them set the narrative on what's fun and what's not like, do goofy, fun things as a family, even if they'd rather be playing a video game or pick up the controller and play with them, you know, um, whatever it might be, but you want to, you want to take the focus off of um, worry and, and put it on something else. Um, well, what time do we have? Okay. Um, so do we have any, I don't want to talk, talk, talk without getting to questions if we have them. Um, but if we don't have them, then I'll definitely go over the coping plan. Well, I'll open it up to a few questions if anybody has questions so far. Um, we'll get just a second for that. And then if we don't have any, then we'll keep going. All right, well, we'll just keep on trucking and then we'll open it to questions at the end. Go for it. Cool. So, um, 
just real quick with coping plans and coping plans is actually something that we're going to discuss more um, at the uh, workshop. Um, it's really important to learn your anxiety profile. So that's identifying early signs of anxiety. Um, you will start, your body speaks to you um, when you're anxious. And maybe there's some, some people who are struggling with anxiety listening right now who are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, that's so true. Your body speaks to you and you're, you're, um, it gives you some kind of warning signs that you're, you're nervous about something. Oftentimes your body can tell you you're nervous about something before your brain can. It's really a very strange thing. Um, but then you want to develop strategies that they, the child can use by themselves, okay? They're not always going to have a support system in place. Um, maybe they're at school, maybe they're at home alone. We want to empower them to deal with and cope with their anxiety by themselves. Step three of this would be, you want to create a list of people that they can rely on. Um, this can be friends, teachers, coaches, um, family members. Um, an important part of this is you want to prep the people that they might be contacting. Um, so if, if they're saying, hey, well, if, if I'm anxious, then I can go talk to Coach Evan. Um, as a parent, you want to say, okay, well, let's go ask Coach Evan if he's okay with that or, or whatever it might be. You want to prep them. Um, and then that leads to step four. And you want to... Um, you want to kind of give the helpers that you've recruited ways that they can help. Okay. You don't want them to just kind of leave them to their own devices and okay, well, great. This kid's talking to me about how nervous they are, but I don't know what to do. Um, so you want to, um, you want to help give them some strategies. Uh, you'll notice I have listed evidence gathering. You know, if a kid says, I don't think anybody likes me at school. Well, why do you say that? You know, make them, make them provide evidence for it or distraction. Well, here's a book you can read. Um, maybe you can watch this YouTube video or give them a compliment on how well they've been, they've been coping with this or how hard they've been working. And then um, step five is something that parents very, very, very rarely, and even other professionals don't do this as much as they should. And that is identifying personal strengths and using those strengths to cope with the anxiety. So what we do is we hyper-focus on this anxiety, the fact that we're not, we're not feeling very good, we're really worried about this, um, and we don't stop and think, okay, well wait, what's going right in my life right now? What, what am I really good at? So, um, you know, if, if the person is creative, then you should have a lot of coping strategies that resolve, revolve around creativity. If they're athletic, you know, distract a lot with sports and with gatherings with friends. If they're compassionate, think of ways that they can serve others and busy themselves with volunteer work. Um, you know, just whatever it is. If they're, if they're a really faithful, loyal friend, um, help them recruit lots of friends that can help them too. Um, we want to use their strengths and let them know that we're using their strengths. Say, you know what, you're having a hard time with this, but you know what you're really good at is this. And I think we should use this to help you cope. Um, so <clears throat> uh, once again, this, this slide is probably a whole presentation um, all by itself, um, but uh, there we go. Um, and I do wanna talk a little bit about how to um, talk about, uh, talk through some anxiety with children. Um, so when they bring it up, um, a lot of parents forget to validate. Um, they jump straight to convince, trying to convince them or to persuasion. Um, Mom, I'm scared. Um, I'm scared a robber's going to come in. Oh, there, there's no break-ins around here. There's no, we've got an alarm system. The doors are locked. You know, nothing's going to happen, right? Because that just feels like the right thing to do. It's such a, a bonkers thought, you know, but we forget to just validate, you know, if you were a little kid and you thought somebody would break in, that would be scary. And just say that. Oh my goodness, that would be scary. I'd be nervous too if I thought somebody was going to break in. Um, you want to explore where the thought is coming from, especially with children. Um, 
where is this coming from all of a sudden? You know, a lot of these thoughts come out of nowhere, they, they feel like, but they've all come from somewhere. It can be a TV show. It can be something that somebody said at school. It can be something they learned at school. I mean, a lot of times kids take very innocent uh, information and they, and they turn it into something uh, else. You know, like maybe... Maybe they were learning about uh, the Great Depression at school or something. And, you know, it was just something they were covering in the curriculum. But, you know, that, that really set with the child. And they, they started worrying about finances. or um, It can be anything like that. And so you want to help explore. Because not only will that help them resolve that anxiety in that moment, but it will also teach them that this is coming from somewhere. It's not like um, I'm broken or I'm going to feel this way all the time. Um, and once you've validated, once you've explored with them, then you can kind of start to, to bring up some counterpoints and say, you know, you know, I know it, it must be scary to think about robbers breaking in. Um, and I know you, it, it's probably, it was probably scary to see that on the news tonight. Um, but what you have to understand is that um, this is a very safe neighborhood. And, um, you know, our neighbor next door is always looking out their window, making sure that everybody's safe. And, um, and then you jump into the last step, which is brainstorming healthy ways. But, you know, since you're nervous tonight, um, maybe we can figure out a way to calm you down. So, uh, would it help if we read a book together? Or maybe you could look at some photo albums to distract you until you fall asleep or, or whatever it might be. Um, so you really want to validate, you want to explore where the thoughts are coming from. You want to offer kind of some counterpoints to them, and then you want to problem solve with them. Um, and you can get through most anxieties through this process. It'll take time and it's not going to get it all knocked out in one night, but um, um, so anyway, so you want to, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, you want to help them to kind of cope. So um, some strategies that you can use at home. Um, so thought stopping is when you just kind of train your mind to kind of identify when you're worrying a lot and just saying okay wait stop let's let's uh let's think about this for a little bit you know and then you can get into cognitive restructuring where it's um you know if i when i give my presentation at school today i'm gonna mess up and everybody's gonna make fun of me um you can say you know what um even if i do mess up and somebody laughs at me, they're going to forget about it tomorrow, you know, or it won't be the worst thing in the world. Um, at least I'll have my assignment done. But teaching them how to put a positive spin on things um, is extremely important. And it's going to be one of those things that you have to do over and over and over and over again. But if you take the time to actually help them to kind of turn that thought on its head, um, they'll start to develop that thinking pattern um, over time. Um, deep breathing. Um, with very young kids, we often use bubble blowing. Um, but deep breathing mimics sleep breathing. Okay, so you remember the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And that kind of pinnacle of, of that was, was sleeping. The deep breathing mimics um, uh, sleep breathing, diaphragmic breathing, and it helps to calm you down no matter what. So um, distractions are good, um, you know, whether it be reading an article, um, your phones are good for distraction. They're also, well, I'm going to talk about phones in December. Um, <laughs> there's another presentation about managing electronics, but um, healthy distractions are great. You know, going outside to play, reading a book, <coughs> cooking something, making a snack, whatever it might be. Um, family meetings. Um, oftentimes families um, kind of get out of the habit of communicating with each other. Family meetings can also just be dinner time together, but um, families fall out of sync and it causes a lot of chaos. And some brains, especially little brains, are just not wired to deal with that. You know, they don't know what's going on and family meetings can really help to provide some structure. Um, active time, just keeping your kids active um, I mean, we talked about structure and hobbies, you know, just developing hobbies. 
recognizing that some hobbies need to be pushed. Um, I think it's appropriate sometimes to say, hey, you know what, I know you hate practicing the piano, but you know, a lot of things are hard at first. Um, I've seen a, a, a kind of a shift in parenting where they just kind of let their kids decide what it is they, they want to do, which is good. It's, you know, especially if they have a, a really good idea of what they want to do, you know, if they're sure they want to learn to play the clarinet or the guitar or whatever, um, then yeah, we want to support them in that. But it's also appropriate not to let them quit, you know, like when it, you say, well, you know, you know, you really wanted to learn that. And I think it's a great thing to learn. And you know, I think you're noticing it's some hard work, but it'll be really, it'll be really um, worth it. And let's see what we can do to support you in that. And um, just teaching kids how to have fun and to be productive um, outside of school. Okay. It's a lot of, a lot of productivity these days is defined by school. And that's not, that's not really appropriate. We want them to, to find their, their place outside of school as well. So um, now that is the end of my presentation. If you don't have any questions. So we'll open it back up um, for a few minutes. We've got about five more minutes. Um, <coughs> and so we'll leave it open for questions um, for the next few minutes. Um, but if we see that there's not any, um, I would definitely encourage you guys to attend um, the workshop this weekend. Um, Dr. Anderson, do you want to give just like maybe a brief overview of what, what this weekend's going to look like? Yeah, so we're going um, to we're going to go more in depth. Um, about anxiety, and we're hopefully going to um, be more targeted. Um, we're, we're expecting a, um, a relatively small group, um, and so I think we're going to be able to get into more personalized questions, and we're going to be able to target the information a little bit better towards what your personal needs are, and we're going to uh, be able to go through um, specific challenges that your child might be having and help you come up with a specific plan. Um, so you'll be able to, <clears throat> everybody will be able to work one-on-one -on -one with me for a little bit. Um, I'll also give uh, another brief overview of, of anxiety. Um, not, not this presentation, um, something a little bit different. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, we're going to do some activities that help us to kind of and do some questions that will help you to kind of get at the sources of your child's anxiety. We're going to teach you how to talk to your children about it. Um, we're going to develop personalized plans for your children um, and for you, <laughs> frankly, because um, adults certainly have a few things to be anxious about too. But, um, but I think it's going to be a good time. I, I, my plan is to keep it uh, kind of casual so that we can um, kind of talk openly and, and really problem solve throughout this this process. Is there is there a cost? No, we do, this um, I do not believe so. There is no cost for this um, workshop on Saturday. Again, it's from nine to twelve here at Anna Shaw. If you're interested, um, you can email me and I and I can take care of getting you signed up. But you can also. Um, RSVP with Heather Mallet. She is our administrative assistant, um, and you can call 706 226 8911. Um, and you should have my email um, in the Zoom confirmation after you register tonight. So, again, we appreciate you guys checking out our um, CHAMPS webinar. We will be doing CHAMPS um, virtual at least in, through February. Um, and so, um, but I, I'm really excited to see the turnout tonight, um, and we look forward to seeing you guys um, next month. I see I got a quick question. Let's see. Yeah, so um, we're super excited about Saturday. I know that I am excited about attending um, as a parent. Um, really just trying to come up with better ways of questioning my child and so that I don't get the answer that I just don't know. I don't know why I'm worried. I don't know why I'm anxious. Um, so yeah, I look forward to seeing any of you guys um, and we will see you Saturday. Thanks. Thanks everyone.